And now, new friction with Russia as the Obama administration reveals its punishment for what it calls interference in the U.S. election. That's where we'll begin as I'm joined here in Washington by Senator Tom Cotton of Arkansas, member of the Senate Armed Services and Intelligence Committees. Senator Cotton, welcome back to Fox News Sunday. Happy New Year. Happy New Year, Shannon. It's great to be on with you. Let's start with the administration's decision to take sanctions and actions against Russia, including expelling 35 Russian intelligence operatives, closing two Russian intelligence compounds in Maryland and New York. There are a number of sanctions on Russian intelligence organizations, companies supporting them, individuals as well. Is it enough? Well, it's not enough, Shannon, and it's certainly too late. Um, Vladimir Putin is KGB. He always has been. He always will be. President Obama has consistently looked the other way from Russia's provocations and aggressions. The DNC hack last year was just one minor item in what Russia has done over the last eight years to include things like invading and occupying Crimea and supporting rebels in eastern Ukraine, as well as threatening NATO airships and, or uh, aircraft and ships and so forth. But what has Barack Obama done for eight years? In the very early days of his administration, just months after Russia had invaded Georgia, he sent Hillary Clinton to push the reset button with the Russian foreign minister. In the middle of his reelection campaign in 2012, he told the Russian president that he would have more flexibility after the election. When Mitt Romney characterized Russia as our number one geopolitical adversary, Barack Obama mocked him and said that the 1980s wanted their foreign policy back. I'm glad the president has finally realized the threat that Russia poses to the United States and our interests, but I wish he had recognized this eight years ago. Well, Russian President Vladimir Putin has responded. Here's a bit of what he had to say. As it proceeds from international practice, Russia has reasons to respond in kind. Although we have the right to retaliate, we will not resort to irresponsible kitchen diplomacy, but will plan our further steps to restore Russian-U.S. relations based on the policies of the Trump administration. He went on to invite all diplomatic children who are in Russia to New Year's and Christmas parties at the Kremlin. What does his response say to you? Well, that's very heartwarming of President Putin. I would recommend the kids not take their iPads to the Kremlin unless they want Russian intelligence services to know what apps they're playing every day for the rest of their lives. Um, look, what Vladimir Putin needs is a sense of new boundaries. He's had a free reign throughout the world over the last eight years. He needs to have a sense of boundaries and to know that costs are going to be imposed if he crosses those boundaries. The administration has not drawn those boundaries and they have not imposed those costs. And in fact, they've gone farther than just being weak on Russia. They've actively opposed measures to toughen up on Russia. I propose measures in our annual intelligence bill, for instance, that would enforce existing travel restrictions on Russian diplomats, by which I mean Russian spies in the United States, that would force the government to, to crack down on these Russian spies who are traveling all around America without the proper approvals. I got a call just weeks ago from a senior administration official after the election, after the hacking, asking me to remove that from the bill because it would be too provocative. So it's not just that Russia has, that the president uh, has, and his administration has been weak on Russia, they have actively stopped other efforts by people like me and other Republicans and Democrats in Congress from trying to draw a firmer line. Well, my understanding is you went to the White House with the concept of something more formal, um, putting together a number of representatives from government agencies to fight back about, uh, against Russian interference or coercion in our politics and what's going on here domestically. My understanding of that is that you got a response basically from the administration saying it was duplicative of what was already in place, it wasn't necessary. Can you tell us more about the response yes. you got? So this is a second measure in the intelligence bill uh, that the administration threatened to veto the bill over. Um, so in the days of the Soviet Union, uh, the Soviet Union had something called active measures. They are influence operations, they're propaganda, they're covert activities trying to undermine Western democracy. Uh, I propose to create a, an, an interagency panel in our government like we had in the days of the Soviet Union that would counteract these uh, so-called active measures. The Obama administration assured us that this was duplicative and they didn't need it. I would simply point out that whatever they have in place right now must not be working given all that Russia has continued to do. In fact, just yesterday, uh, the administration acknowledged that Russia has continued to try to hack U.S. information systems, even after Barack Obama reportedly told Vladimir Putin to, quote, cut it out. So whatever measures they have in place have not been working. I, I wish they wouldn't have gone to such great lengths to undermine the efforts of Congress to take a tougher line on Russia these last eight years. Well, you mentioned the report that we got from the Department of Homeland Security and the FBI together pointing out what they say are credible links um, showing the tools and infrastructure that Russian uh, civilian and military operators, intelligence operators, were using to penetrate numerous systems here 
in the U.S. Now, we got a response from President-elect Trump to that saying, it's time for our country to move on to bigger and better things. Nevertheless, in the interest of our country and its great people, I will meet with leaders of the intelligence community next week in order to be updated on the facts of this situation. Is that enough for you? Do you think he needs to take a harder line when presented with the hard evidence that was outlined in this report? Well, again, the hack of the DNC last year, which the intelligence community has said publicly uh, was the result of Russian intelligence services or their affiliates, is just one small example of Russia's nefarious activities over the last eight years. Um, now, many Democrats and some in the media are trying to confuse that question, the action of the hacking, which Russian intelligence services or their affiliates undertook, with the impact on the election. And unless Vladimir Putin hacked into Hillary Clinton's calendar and canceled all of her rallies in Michigan and Wisconsin or canceled her speeches in which she was going to lay out an effective agenda for the working class, that didn't have an impact on this election. It was Hillary Clinton's own decision to create a private email server that had a much bigger impact along with her failures as a candidate. So it, it's time that Hillary Clinton look in the mirror and the Democrats take stock of why they lost the election rather than blaming it on Vladimir Putin or fake news or the Electoral College or anything else. Russia, though, will continue to be an adversary into the future and we continue to need to draw firmer lines with Russia on their behavior and to impose costs when they cross those lines. And to be clear, we, we always want to make the distinction, no one is alleging that Russia broke into voter systems, changed votes, changed vote tallies, not those kinds of things that would have been a direct impact on votes as they were counted and tallied in deciding the presidency. I want to ask you about Rex Tillerson, the uh, Exxon CEO who has been uh, nominated to be Secretary of State. You've met with him. Um, he has been criticized by those who feel he has two friendly a relationship with Russia. Are you convinced he can take a hard line? How do you think he's going to or not make it through the Senate? Well, I, I had a good conversation with Rex Tillerson, not just about Russia and Putin, but about many of the issues that we face around the world, as well as the challenges of managing the State Department. Uh, I think it's a good thing when a Secretary of State uh, understands foreign leaders and understand the cultures and the history of foreign peoples. Uh, I think it will help help him take a firm line in defense of U.S. interest as Secretary of State in the same way that he took a firm line in defense of the shareholders of ExxonMobil's interest with Vladimir Putin when he was the CEO of ExxonMobil. That's what we need, hard-nosed, clear-eyed, unsentimental statesmanship that we haven't had for the last eight years as President Obama and his administration have been continuing to look the other way and continue to conciliate and appease adversaries like Vladimir Putin. Well, and this administration also took some bold steps in recent days with regard to Israel that voted the UN. They didn't veto it. They didn't block this measure uh, that moved forward. John Kerry, uh, Secretary of State, in defending that in a speech after the vote, talked about the fact that no administration has been better to Israel. He talked about a number of times that this administration has defended Israel. Israel. Um, you said this, though, about the U.N. vote. This cowardly, disgraceful action cements President Obama's richly deserved legacy as the most anti-Israel president in American history. Clearly a disconnect between the two uh, views on the way you see his legacy. Well, I think the last week uh, has been a fitting punctuation mark on eight years of Barack Obama's presidency. First, he abstained at the United Nations in the same ways that he's abstained from leadership in the world for eight years. And second, he was much harsher on his allies than his adversaries. Uh, at root, the problem uh, that we face in the Holy Land is not uh, is Israelites building new uh, neighborhoods around Jerusalem. It's that the Palestinians refuse to acknowledge uh, Israel's right to exist as a Jewish state in the Holy Land. Until they do that, there won't be a peace agreement between the two peoples. Uh, Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu reacted to Secretary Kerry's speech, and he made a very specific allegation. Here's a bit of what he said. We have it on absolutely incontestable evidence that the United States organized, advanced, and brought this resolution to the United Nations Security Council. We'll share that information with the incoming administration. Some of it is sensitive. It's all true. Uh, you said that President Obama is personally responsible for that U.N. resolution. Quote, his diplomats secretly coordinated the vote. Are you privy to evidence? Uh, what do you base that claim on? No, I, I'm not privy to what Prime Minister Netanyahu was speaking about, but, but anyone with an ounce of common sense knows how the real world works and knows how the United Nations Security Council works. Senegal and Malaysia, some of the countries that sponsored this resolution, don't call the shots there. If Barack Obama and John Kerry and Samantha Power hadn't been speaking for months about the prospect of this resolution and had not been creating a climate inside the Security Council to let it come forward without firmly saying we will veto any one-sided anti-Israel resolution, no country would have brought that resolution forward. It only could have been brought forward and passed with explicit United States coordination with the other members of the Security 
Security Council. Very quickly, we're just about out of time. You wrote an op-ed uh, piece in the New York Times about immigration, saying that uh, President-elect Trump has a clear mandate um, to stop illegal immigration, but also to finally cut the generation-long influx of low-skilled immigrants that undermines American workers. So you know there are going to be those who argue and say he didn't win the popular vote, there's not a clear mandate, but also question whether you're saying we also need to slow legal immigration? Yes, absolutely. Uh, illegal immigration is a real problem, uh, and that was a big issue in the campaign as well, to build a wall and, and to crack down on criminals and drug dealers who are here illegally. But our immigration system for too long has brought in too many unskilled and low-skilled workers, which has undercut wages for working Americans. We need an immigration system that focuses on the well-being and the needs of American citizens, whether they can trace their ancestry back to the Mayflower or whether they're brand new immigrants that just took the oath of citizenship. And our economy simply doesn't need the levels of skilled and low-skilled immigration that we have today when we're giving out a million green cards a year and million more temporary visas every year that undercuts American wages. We need to focus on nuclear family reunification and ultra-high skilled immigration that fits demonstrated economic need. We know all those reforms are heavy lift on Capitol Hill so we'll be watching. Senator, thank you for your time today and Happy New Year. Thanks Shannon. Happy New Year.